did. All right, <laughs> folks. She didn't know what she was in for. I need to go Sorry to, to our listening Coast. audience. We're a few minutes late. I think it's the early darkness these days. Welcome to the Wednesday, October 14, 2015 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. First item on the agenda, approval of the minutes from September 9. I spotted one error um, on the second page, the large paragraph that begins the tree commission. Um, it recommends option and it should read two. That option is the option that keeps the tree out of the ground until occupancy. So it doesn't get run over by the construction and mm. stuff. Um, Anyway, so that was the only thing that I observed in the minutes. Any other corrections or other notes? I move the approval of the minutes. Thank you, Joel. With corrections. Second. Okay, Wendy. All in favor of approving the minutes of September 9, say aye. 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 Um, opposed and abstentions. Abstention. Me too. Gregory and Rob. Thank you. All right. Uh, correspondence. Anything from staff? Uh, nothing from staff. Thank you. Anything from the commissioners? Joel, Transportation Commission meeting. Uh, the Transportation Commission meeting that was originally scheduled for, I think, the somewhere around the 10th of this month has been deferred until the 29th. So the next meeting of the Transportation Commission will be 4 to 6 on the 29th, Thursday, uh, and I have not seen an agenda. <laughs> okay. Um, at this point in our agenda, we open the microphone to members of the public who may speak to the Commission regarding matters that are not on the agenda are currently pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission. There is no one here in the audience tonight. So, moving on, Mike, number six, public hearing, amendment of Title IV, Chapter 5, regarding flood hazard areas. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, before you tonight, we have an amendment, or actually a few amendments to uh, section or chapter 5 of the zoning code, which is uh, uh, Title IV, which is our flood hazard areas chapter. And uh, just wanted to start off, I know you've all seen this before, but just wanted to highlight again uh, our special areas of special flood hazard within the city of Moscow. Uh, we've got Paradise Creek running through the heart of the city. We also ha have the South Fork of the Palouse River, uh, which just barely skirts the southern boundary uh, of the city. And I also want to take this opportunity to point out, you know, we talked about it before, but uh, the letter of map revision that happened a few years ago, which took roughly about 80, 90 properties uh, out of the downtown area, and you can see this, is, this would be the revised uh, channel, mainly in the Gormley Field area here. And that was part of that Paradise uh, Creek Daylighting Project, uh, which was affiliated with the Recreation Center when that was constructed. So looking at uh, really what Chapter 5 does, uh, it regulates those special flood hazard areas, so the two creeks in town. Uh, we lays out methods for reducing flood loss, uh, it also lays out the duties and responsibilities of the zoning floodplain administrator, uh, also known as the zoning administrator, so that would be the community development department. Uh, also lays out a process for the appeals and variances uh, for floodplain uh, issues within the city. And it also has standards for new or substantial improvement to residential or non-residential construction. And so we're talking about principal structures, uh, not really talking about accessory structures here because uh, those aren't required to be covered by the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So where this all originated was that we were contacted earlier this year uh, by IDWR, and that's on behalf of uh, FEMA. And they were conducting a, a, a mandatory floodplain ordinance review, and they do that about every 10 years 
our last review was around 2004, so we were uh, a little past due. And they identified that some standards needed to be updated or added within our ordinance, things like definitions. We had some uh, state code references that's since been uh, updated uh, under the, the state statutes. We had some uh, misinformation. We had a, a, an old map number in there. Uh, we needed some variance and appeal procedures updated, uh, as well as manufactured home and uh, some inclusion of lowest floor uh, elevation within our ordinance. And just again to give you a little bit of information about why IDWR was asked uh, or was contacting us about the, our floodplain ordinance was that uh, they're really the entity within the state that FEMA works through in order to implement uh, floodplain ordinances. And they were reviewing about 50 across the state. They work with the, uh, the local municipality uh, in order to meet all the NFIP requirements. Uh, but they can only make recommendations. And so if, if you don't uh, take their advice and update your ordinance, uh, they just give that report to FEMA, and then FEMA has to probably send you a nasty letter and, and contact you directly about making those changes. So uh, they have the authority through the National Flood Insurance Program. And so what the National Flood Insurance Program does is that it allows federally backed flood insurance for all structures that are within the 100-year floodplain. So... We have done steps above and beyond uh, within that program in order to achieve that. I think the base rate is about 10 percent ju just by belonging to the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and we do certain things, uh, stream maintenance, uh, clearance, monitoring, uh, information gets sent out every year. Uh, we keep elevation certificates, things of that nature, and that gives us about a 5 percent bump. Uh, which allows citywide reduction in rates. And so if you're a, a mortgage uh, holder and you're in the 100-year floodplain, you're required to carry flood insurance, uh, you're able to get a 15% reduction in your premiums every year because we do those things. And so that's why it's, it's kind of a big deal. Um, and the NFIP requires certain minimum requirements. And so right now we're, we're really in a little bit of jeopardy about uh, – not being in good standing with the NFIP program and maybe jeopardizing uh, that 15% reduction. So looking at the, the proposed ordinance before you tonight, uh, we had to change our statutory authorization. It used to be in the Local Land Use Planning Act. Uh, now it's since been moved to Title 46, Militia and Military Affairs, and that's mainly because Chapter 10 of that title has the State Disaster Preparedness Act. Uh, we have some sections about findings of facts, uh, losses caused by inadequate structures, uh, maybe structures that aren't tied down uh, properly and, and can float away and cause issues downstream. Uh, it talks about how the primary responsibility lies with the local government, uh, City of Moscow. And we also have uh, a statement of purpose, as with all or most uh, zoning planning issues, it all comes down to promoting the public health, safety, and general welfare of the public at large, and also to, uh, to minimize public and private losses due to flood conditions in uh, those specific 100-year floodplain areas. And it goes through some general objectives and methods for reducing flood losses, and those are really uh, general statements about why we do these things, and then in, later on in the, the ordinance, uh, or the actual restrictions and, and which allow you to, to further uh, these goals. And so restricting or prohibiting some uses, uh, protection against flood damage for new structures, preserve stream channels, uh, control actions which may increase flood damage. So that could be, uh, you know, further downstream, somebody installs something that uh, ends up getting away from them, not tied down correctly, ends up floating downstream, diverting the channel, and uh, creating more damage uh, downstream if they would have done it properly. Prevent unauthorized construction of flood barriers. You can have the same issue here. It maybe affects downstream uh, floodplains. <clears throat> and then the definition section. I'm not going to bore you with all the definitions that were changed, but a lot of them were uh, just a little bit of updating. And then some were added. So we have this flood protection elevation, uh, which is really uh, new terminology since we uh, our last update in 2004, basically saying the base flood elevation plus two feet of freeboard. And so right now the language in our ordinance says base flood elevation uh, plus two feet. 
but it never really references the flood protection elevation. So they're uh, bringing in this terminology, and it, it's really it, it simplifies it on our end, and I think it simplifies it on the public's end when they're trying to interpret the ordinance. Uh, we go on to, to talk about freeboard. Uh, what is freeboard? And that, I mean, if you have the base flood elevation where a 100 year flood only gets to that level, why do you need to elevate it two feet above that? And it's really a factor of safety expressed in feet above the base flood elevation that compensates for wave action, obstructed bridge openings, debris and ice jams, and hydrologic effects of urbanization in a watershed. So uh, it's more of like a safety mechanism. Uh, in order to uh, you know elevate it two feet, so you don't have as much damage. Uh, maybe it you know maybe there are some obstructions. Maybe you're over at Bridge Street where you have a honeycomb culvert uh, underneath the bridge, and you you know but log jam or debris gets clogged in there. Uh, it ends up uh, going above the hundred-year floodplain. It's to account for those types of uh, occurrences. And we have substantial damage. Uh, this is just new terminology. It's really tied to uh, substantial improvement definition. So uh, usually if you do a substantial improvement for a structure, uh, so it's you know, around 50% of the, uh, the market value of the structure is as soon as you start the construction, uh, now they have substantial damage. So if the, the structure is damaged beyond a certain amount, uh, now you're going to have to be included with the substantial improvement and you'd have to bring the, the structure up to current floodplain standards. They have market value a little bit better defined. Uh, it was real general before, so there's a couple different ways uh, you could kind of determine market value. Maybe it's the assessed value. Maybe it was the uh, last value that when you sold the property. And so it, it pretty much clearly defines how you're supposed to calculate the market value. And so... Uh, a little more predictability there. And we also have provisions that uh, include substantial damaged structures but exempts historic structures and projects correcting certain local code violations. So uh, if there's a code requirement that's a uh, life safety violation and it requires a, a substantial improvement, then you're really exempt from uh, bringing it up to standards because it's that local code that's requiring that. And then uh, just another positive for having a historic structure and, and preserving that is that uh, you don't have to uh, bring it up to, to current standards with the, the floodplain ordinance if you own that property. And Section 5.3, our general provisions and administration, not a whole lot's changed here. Uh, the provisions for flood hazard reduction, they just really did some rearranging and a little bit of updating. Uh, we inserted, uh, we used, within our subdivision ordinance, we currently have the floodplain standards, and so we've shifted those uh, to this portion to make it all in one, one area. And when we go in and, and do our street tree uh, revisions, we'll go ahead and take that out of the subdivision standards, but it's really the same language. Uh, so we, we have a little bit of redundancy right now, but that'll be, be corrected in the next few months when we uh, move forward with our street tree. Uh, program revisions. We also have an accessory structure section. And so I think last time I talked with you about this, we were uh, contacted by the, the floodplain administrator, and they had mentioned that uh, we're able, and this is, this is so I, I think I mentioned before, like wet flood proofing uh, was eliminated for accessory structures. Well, they have a, a section in the model ordinance that they're not calling it wet flood proofing anymore but there's an accessory structure section which essentially allows you to do those wet, flu f wet flood proofing uh, things. Just have a, a, an engineer architect certify uh, that the uh, structure is going to meet all those requirements. Uh, all the HVAC and heating utility equipment has to be elevated to the uh, two feet above the base flood elevation, has to meet the opening requirements, can't be used for human habitation. And so uh, really the NFIP and FEMA's main concern is principal structures, houses. Um, when we submit the, our elevation certificates for structures in the floodplain, and we have to do this on an annual basis, uh, they don't really want the ones that are for accessory structures. They don't really look at them. It's mainly just for principal structures. Uh, new buildings, whether it's a single-family dwelling, two-family dwelling, maybe it's a commercial dwelling, 
Uh, those are the ones that they want to look at, and they don't require uh, all the regular dry flood proof or elevation standards for accessory structures. Uh, so I've gone ahead and inserted that back in there to give them that people that option. And they allow a total square footage that you can grant this relief. And so the language is that relief from the elevation or dry flood proofing standards may be granted for an accessory structure containing no more than 1,500 square feet. And I'm looking at page 13 of 17 of your proposed ordinance. And that's the new language. Such structure must be certified by a registered professional engineer or architect uh, that the structure meets or exceeds the following standards. And then you go through those standards. Uh, but we ended up uh, stopping on 1,500 square feet, mainly because that's the maximum uh, residential accessory structure that you can have. Uh, 1,000 by right and then 1,500 through a conditional use permit process. And so um, that's what, uh, that's a new insertion since, since last time you saw it. Then our variance and appeal procedures, uh, mainly some updating in this section, but uh, pretty much the same as when you last uh, saw this. We added some criteria for approving variances within the special flood hazard area. And then as well as uh, variance uh, appeals uh, of zoning administrator interpretations. Uh, we added some criteria for the Board of Adjustment to be able to look at those and review those. So uh, staff's recommendation tonight is to conduct a public hearing and upon consideration of the testimony presented, uh, either recommend approval of the ordinance as presented, uh, approval of the ordinance with modifications, or do not recommend approval and take other action as deemed appropriate. And I'd certainly be able to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Mike? It's not, Mike. Um, so I guess I'll open the public hearing then and invite members of the public who are not present <laughs> to come forward. So therefore, I'll close the public hearing. Um, and the commission can begin to deliberate. Which could take the form of somebody making a motion. Well, it seems like we've <laughs> seen it in various forms in three times, and it looks pretty straightforward. And mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm comfortable about moving approval to, for consideration by council. Right. That would be we'll recommend it to council. I'll second. Thank you, Joel. Um, yeah, it's. Thank you, Mike, for a, a long slog of we've seen this since April or something. <laughs> <laughs> Finally got We're it drowning in it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Finally got it to the finish line. So. My strategy, wear you down and then <laughs> <laughs> <no questions. laughs> Well, and I'm looking at John, and I know that we can't do anything but say yes. Because so. <laughs> it's the key to the insurance right. rate. Absolutely. So anyway, we have a motion in a second. Um, unless there's any other discussion, all in favor of recommending the flood, blah, 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 the amendment to Title IV, Chapter 5 regarding flood hazard areas to City Council. Say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. I think that passed unanimously, Ann. And Mike, you are back up. Number seven is use table introduction. Well, I don't know if this is necessarily an introduction. I think we had maybe talked about it briefly uh, a few years ago as part of the kind of strategy for updating the zoning code. But I'm sure that uh, you'd either forgotten about that or we have uh, some new folks that maybe haven't seen. We've talked about it a couple times with the street tree uh, program updates about we're working on the, the use table update and uh, we should be probably bringing those around concurrently uh, together and so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about what we've been working on and uh, the current structure of the zoning code so right now within the zoning code you have the two column format and so this is uh, we've been wanting to get away from this for a while just because it's 
it, it's hard to work with. Um, you don't really see it other than legal documents, and I, I think it's just a, uh, a uh, it was carried over. Uh, our whole city code is in the two-column format, and it's really just a legal format. You don't typically see zoning codes uh, in that format because they have illustrations, tables. They contain you know, a whole lot of uh, different information than just text. And so we've been wanting to move away from that for a while. Um, we have all the uses. So we go through with uh, each zone, and then we list all the uses within each zone, and then we have other uh, conditional uses, special uses, limitations on uses. We used to cover fences. We've since uh, centralized that, if you recall. Uh, we've moved that into one location instead of the redundancy of having it under each uh, zoning district. And so that's really what we do right now is we have all the zones and then we have all the uses listed under each zone. There's really no one central place where you can look at a, a use table and see all the uses and where they're uh, located. We also have an issue with uh, some inconsistencies with at the end of the zoning code we have all the different definitions of the, the terms or the uses uh, which are used within the zoning code and sometimes those are conflicting. So we have uh, professional offices, I'll provide example here in a second, uh, where we a lot of times we have some language that's similar to the definition but just a little bit different that we use uh, as the use in the zone and then in the end uh, we have maybe some contradictory uh, examples uh, that we list in the definition. And so uh, we have some issues there. And we have really no correlation to outside reference to assist determinations of use allowance or comparable uses. And so, uh, you know, as technology is always changing and people are thinking up new and improved uses that uh, really the zoning code didn't think of when it was adopted, uh, re we really don't have a way to allow those uses even though they may have no uh, effect other you know any more of an effect than some of the uses that are currently listed within the zone uh, so a lot of people have gone towards the NIACS North American Industry Classification System and that's really a Census Bureau uses that uh, a lot of the federal government uh, work uses that and it's really the standard use to classify business establishments and so um, you, know, you see a lot of the, the zoning codes where they have uses. Uh, and the way that NIACS is structured is they'll have a, a big parent directory, maybe it's agricultural uses. Uh, and then they'll have a bunch of sub-uses underneath that. And you can really, instead of listing all those sub-uses within your zoning code, uh, you can list that maybe parent use or general use and and it would include all those sub uses underneath that so it ends up being uh, a lot less information but I know it's small font but I just wanted to show you the current structure of our code and these are two pages so they're not four columns uh, this is a, a different page right here and so you go through and this is residential zoning districts um, you go through a little bit of purpose, but you have the each zone talks about the intent of the zone. You have all the permitted principal uses laid out here. Uh, really hard to read because they're you know embedded in a way which you have to read through, and and some of them you know get lost in others, and it's really just tough to to navigate through the code. Uh, conditional uses, we've got special uses, uh, minimum lot area requirements. So I have an example of professional office. So this would be, you know, within our listed uses, uh, we'll have something about a professional office use, a residential office and neighborhood business. This is really what we have for what would you would call a professional office. So a lawyer, architect, counselor, accountants. So it's really a long-winded uh, use and pretty much describes a professional office. But it also has uh, beauty and barbershops, graphic artists, and photogra photographic studios uh, at the end. Central business, general business, and urban mixed commercial. A lot shorter of a use, but that it's still pretty much a professional office. Professional financial business and medical offices and any enterprise rendering professional or personal services. R4. 
we have a little bit of a, this is really distinct because R4 is a residential zone, but we do allow professional offices. We just limit it to 2,000 square feet in size of, of gross floor area. So that, you know, probably not going to change there, but still a really distinct use, professional offices that don't exceed the 2,000 square feet, uh, which are structurally in harmony with adjoining residential buildings. So these are all professional offices. We just have, uh, you know, from, from zone to zone, uh, we call them different things. And then we get to the end, uh, the definition of a professional office. So office maintained and used as a place of business conducted by persons engaged in the healing arts for human beings, such as doctors, dentists, uh, as long as there's no overnight care, uh, engineers, attorneys, architects, accounts, and persons providing services, utilizing training and knowledge of the mental discipline as distinguished from training and occupations requiring mere, mere skill or manual dexterity or the handling of commodities. So you have a, a pretty broad spectrum there, and you also have a lot of, you know, the same language uh, re redundancy in those zones. And plus you, you're listing all these things uh, five, six times because it's under each zone. And so you have, you know, the, the zoning codes ends up being about twice the size because you have all these uses that are uh, in there uh, multiple times. Looking at restaurants, urban mixed commercial, uh, we have that under entertainment, dancing, and recreation establishments, and then we give an example, restaurants, bars, theaters, video arcades, art studios, dance halls, uh, physical fitness centers, so gyms. Neighborhood business, uh, com under a completely different use area. So we've got retail sales, personal services, including restaurants. And so in one sense, we're saying it's entertainment, dancing, including restaurants, and, and now it's lumped together under retail sales, personal services, uh, and neighborhood business. Central business, general business, similar, uh, well, it's not similar. We've got eating and drinking establishments, catering primarily to on-premise consumers, uh, entertainment, dancing, recreation establishments, restaurants, bars, theaters, video arcades, dance halls, and physical fitness centers. So some of the same language as urban mixed commercial, but still pretty much the same use, uh, just said differently it, with different uh, uses and in, examples included in there. Motor business, almost the same, but doesn't have the restriction on on-premise consumers. Uh, which will probably be another conversation about uh, why we would prohibit takeout downtown area. So, you know, food vendors uh, walk up, uh, you know, Cookie Shack or I maybe mean, it was some, something similar to Vlad's uh, Suvlaki that was on the Royal Inn lot. Uh, why they, you know, would need to provide some type of uh, outdoor seating in order to uh, say that they, you know, had on-premise uh, consumption of the food there. So that would be a different conversation, but we don't have a definition of what a restaurant is uh, on the back, so this has caused some, some issues. Uh, probably example is the perch, um, you know, that was on the gray area between a, a bar and a restaurant. Um, you know, that, that was one of the issues. I think we have a restaurant defined uh, maybe in our, our alcohol section of the city code, but nowhere in the zoning code. So um, got, a, got an issue there. So uh, with the use table, what we're striving for is really just a consistent use uh, of the terms across all zoning districts. What it achieves is really just a one centralized location where you can give this side-by-side -side comparison of all the districts and all the uses. Uh, you don't have to thumb through all the different zones in order to figure out what's allowed or if the use you want to uh, establish is allowed in that zone. You can go straight to the table. Uh, it also has a clean list of terms uh, which can be defined at the end of uh, the zoning code so we don't have any gaps where the restaurant's not defined. And it's going to make it a more compact document and that's just basically because of the, the reduction of the redundant language. And so we've been working on this for the last few months, and uh, up to this point, this is what uh, really the structure looks like. And so I just really wanted to give you an update um, within the next month or two. Uh, we're hope hopefully going to finalize this, and then I'll be able to put this in uh, your packets to have you start taking a look at it. 
but really just uh, we have all the residential uses here, so all the different dwellings. Uh, and then you go across the board and you've got all the different zones, whether they be residential or commercial. So you can go to one location, hey, you know, looking at developing a single family dwelling, uh, where, what, you know, zone could that possibly be located in? It'll tell me if it's a conditional use permit, tell me if it's permitted by right. Uh, I know it's hard to read on, on the screen here, but um, you've got permitted use, permitted accessory use, uh, conditional use permit. And then uh, blank just means it's not permitted uh, within that zone. So we break out all the, the lists of uh, uses, you know, list them over here. And we also have that NIACS number here. So um, just to give you an example of, of what that does for us, looking at, say, this says educational services as a, as a use. You look over at this number number says 611. So if you go to the, the NIACS definition, educational services, the same use, uh, gives a, a narrative description and so this would probably end up being uh, the definition at the end of the zoning code. Uh, gives a really detailed narrative description about what educational services are and this is really the parent directory, so 611 and then it breaks it down further here. So underneath educational services, these are all the things that are specifically allowed and these would tech, you know, generally have some type of uh, description of those as well. Elementary and secondary schools, junior colleges, colleges, university and professional schools, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you get into some of these gray area institutions where um, you know, maybe it's something that uh, is, you know, ha hasn't been tried before, you haven't seen it before, you don't really know how to address it. Uh, they break it down even further. So, um, you know, pro just provides that level of detail, and so you don't have to say all these individual uses uh, within your zoning code. You don't have to say junior colleges, colleges, universities, professional schools. Uh, you can just say we allow educational services. Uh, and then all the all those specific uses would be allowed under that umbrella. So that's pretty much it. We uh, we're like I said, we're just finishing the use table right now, and re uh, what we're going to end up doing is reformatting the zoning code. Because if you recall, uh, looking at that two column format, we're going to end up having to to put this table in there, but that's not going to leave a whole lot of information underneath each zone. You're going to have a little bit of probably intent statement. Uh, you probably have some limitations on uses and then probably the setbacks, but we'll probably move towards uh, a table with a setback so you can just go towards the table and, and uh, setbacks, building height, uh, lot area, you know, all those things could be included within a table as well so you don't have to thumb through each zone. It could all be in that centralized location. You could look at the uses and you could look at the setbacks and uh, really end up being uh, a lot easier for us to work with and then, you know, architects, engineers, or the public uh, looking through the document. So uh, what we'd envision, I think what we talked about before was uh, our street tree planning program revision. Uh, I sent out emails this week just to give you an update uh, to the, the members of the advisory committee. We have about seven or eight of uh, folks on there and uh, hoping to, to start conducting meetings probably within the next week or two once I get confirmation from everybody. And so I think it's envisioned that we probably only take two, three meetings to get a recommendation to you all and then uh, we'd probably start working through uh, the street tree planning program revisions as well as the use table and the reformatting of the zoning code at the same time. So probably a month, month and a half and uh, we could do that concurrently and then I don't see any other reason why we couldn't do the relevant criteria and standards at that time too. So trying to throw a lot at you. Comments? I assume part of the reason why the um, language is different in some of the different zones was the intent to to limit some of the some of the uses. Um, I, I guess I'd be interested in the, a few more comments from you as to exactly how 
uh, you propose to do that with the table, uh, I, I can see there's, there's likely to be instances where the 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 generic code uh, is, is probably the appropriate thing to put in, but uh, um, historically we've had some uh, misgivings about some some of the things that might be listed under that code. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we've been incrementally going through and, and analyzing uh, all the uses, you know, like, like for instance, the, the restaurant uses here. And and uh, if there's a, a solid reason, I think we'll probably make note of those. And if there's a, a good reason to carry that through with the amendment, uh, I you know, I don't see any issue with doing that. I, you know, one of the examples is, is uh, like our RTO zone, Alturas is having the discussion right now about uh, whether or not to amend the RT, RTO zone and allow medical offices in the business park. Well, that, that's you look at professional offices and, and it says that you can have some type of doctor's or dentist's office uh, there. And so, um, you know, that'd be the question. Previously, I think that that was excluded purposely from that district for one reason or the other. And so I think that they may have had a good reason, they may have not, but I think it's time to come back and maybe revisit why, you know, where we want specific uses and where we don't want those types of uses. And so uh, I think that, you know, it'll probably take a few months for you guys to, to look through the table and maybe identify that, well, we don't allow medical offices and RTO or uh, we don't allow professional offices with uh, long-term care for medical uh, clinics and R4 or neighborhood business, and maybe we should. So, um, you know, we're we're still kind of working working through it ourselves, but we just noticed that you have a lot of redundancies and you have maybe some uh, conflicting language between the definitions and the individual uh, uses within each zone. And so, you know, just working with it, and, and having questions in those zones, I guess it's uh, highlighted a little bit more than it is maybe just looking at it on the screen here. So, Could you put the table back up? Yep. And was it the next step where you got that circle to appear? There. What I saw there, Joel, is you see under educational services where there are two of the sub NIAC categories. Mm -hmm. It's hard to read. So what I'm thinking is maybe you end up with educational services will permit that in motor business, whatever, but we'll leave it blank for R4. Mm -hmm. But we will permit the subcode for elementary schools in R4. So I think I'm imagining that's how the nuance that's probably can be how, it, how it can be done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to complicate the table, but uh, it's probably necessary. Uh, it, yeah. if, if we want the distinction, if we want the distinction, you have to have some way to subtract or add the sub pieces. Mm -hmm. About the only way to subtract the uh, ability to do a, one of the sub ones is to actually break out the the code mm -hmm. as explicit subcodes mm -hmm. yeah and that'll be the issue is that when we need to get to that level of detail where we want to exclude one of those subcategories from you know specific zones that that's what just what we'll have to do just like educational services you know we've got business schools and computer and management training broken out and technical and trade schools broken out because we don't allow it anywhere except for RTO zone so mm -hmm. um, you know that that's kind of what we've been doing uh, through the through this process is trying to work with the NIACs and, and try to get those nailed down. But, um, I mean, it's tough because you, you go through the subcategories, and so, like, manufacturing is a big one. You know, some of the manufacturing listed on there, I don't, I mean, it's like heavy uh, aeronautical, manu I mean, it's things that you probably wouldn't see here. <laughs> But you probably don't want to exclude either because, you know, maybe Boeing wants to come to Moscow and, uh, you know. Uh -huh. so Probably not that town. Yeah. <laughs> but, 
And so, uh, and what if you do want to exclude that, however? So you, you're, you've got this NIAC definition that you're referencing, but there's a part of it that you don't want to use. So how, I guess I'm trying to see in my mind how it is that you would exclude. It's kind of like what Joel's talking about, but where you want to make changes that um, are different from what the, the standard definition is, then where do you, how flexible is the, uh, the table in doing that? Do you end up having to write it back in the code for the yeah. definition, which then kind of gets you, that loses then the intent of simplifying? Um, yeah, and we're still working through where that would be best. I mean, if it's not specifically listed, just because our code's exclusionary, it means it's not allowed. Um, a lot of times within the definition, it'll give those examples, uh, you know, all the subcategories. And what we've been doing right now is just kind of striking through the ones that maybe don't fit okay. underneath our, uh, you know, maybe our ideal example of what light manufacturing is. You know, maybe we see one of those subcategories is more of a heavy manufacturing. And so, uh, we just eliminate that. I don't know if we'd say the language excluding this in the definition, uh, or you know, if it was allowed in one zone but al not allowed in any of the other ones, we'd probably just list it like we have here in one of the subcategories. But uh, that's one we're still wrangling with a little bit about how to do that. And in one, you know, in one regard, it simplifies it with the NIACs, but it doesn't simplify. <laughs> Yeah, when we're working through it, it, it's really there's there's so many subcategories and, and main categories and terminology. That's really what's taken us so long yeah. is, is to work through all that and try to think of everything that you could possibly imagine as a use and try to cover that, whether it be the you know the umbrella category or one of those subcategories, and so. Uh, it's just taken us quite a while to, to try to do that. But I think in the end, um, having those NIACs terms in there, I think it's going to simplify it for people, and it'll be universal. I mean, just because the government and so many other municipalities uh, started to use the NIACs definitions, um, it'll be, you know, when an industry comes to town or, uh, you know, a, a new use, uh, they'd be familiar with the NIACs uh, terminology, and, and we'd be able to easily kind of identify where they would or would not be located. So, I suppose you could always, uh, I'm not sure, what, I can't really see the table well enough, but whatever, whatever the symbol is that says it's allowed, you can always uh, put an asterisk next to it and say, uh, see the text for exclusions. <laughs> yeah, and that... that well, that's, that I sort should, of defeats the, the, the purity of the table, but... Uh, well, I should have put the last page on there because that, that's really what we have. Let me see if I can bring it up. It seems like I've seen codes do that and just list exceptions after a table. Yeah. Just boom, 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 boom. You know, so. <laughs> Um. <clears throat> I guess what strikes me is right now the way it's written you could wonder do they mean the same thing they just didn't use quite as many words mm -hmm. or literally do they mean uh, or, or is that a splitting of a hair that yeah are there some exclusions in that in that, <laughs> in that, that difference I don't quite read <laughs> yeah and so However challenging the table will be, it may be clearer to say yeah. this zone is just like that zone for this purpose. Yeah, yeah. and we have so many, so many of those uh, little nuances within our, our existing code about special, you know, special conditions on certain uses. That that that's really been part of the struggle for carrying, right. trying to carry those over. 
and this is so this is what we've done so you have um, <clears throat> so if you go up and and look at uh, you see that a little bit better so we have uh, so for permitted uses for instance we have um, uh. the the number here like p13 well that's drive up windows so central business says p13 so you'd go down to the bottom the footnotes there 13 drive up windows permitted for financial institutions only cup required for drive up windows and associated with all their uses so yeah. you know right now the way we've done that is just done these uh you know footnotes about what that means and then just had uh the the reference to the number um right by the whether it's permitted or not and so uh, that's how we've been keeping track of it right yeah. now that's the way a lot of other codes do it too but they don't necessarily have 16 to 20 at the bottom you know maybe they only have five and so that's what we've been struggling with is either we have a new use that we put on there that says uh, you know drive through windows for financial institutions and then maybe just drive through windows so you either have it r a redundant uh, in the use or you have it at the bottom of the table as a footnote so um, that you know that that's another question that we've been trying to to work through uh, but that seems to be the best way to do it uh, right now but we're that's still a work in progress so. <laughs> Other comments? I like the concept. I, 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 yeah. I, I basically like it if we <laughs> figure out how to <laughs> not let it get too complicated. <laughs> the, the only other question that I had was um, relative to the the way zoning codes or ordinances have to be structured by law um, and whether or not um, that incorporating the table is going to be um, Difficult, well, maybe difficult really isn't the right word, but the, the reason ordinances are written in a particular format is because there's a legal, legal requirement for that. So is it going to be problematic to incorporate the table with all the legal requirements for way, the way it has to be formatted? Yeah, I don't know that, uh, I mean, our ordinance have a, a proper format, but I don't know that the specific document itself, it's like, you know, with a resolution with our uh, legacy crossing design guidelines. I mean, that that's all in design. Uh, okay. You know, that doesn't have any type of structure to it. And uh, so you see, you know, zoning codes all over the country, like, like I said, a lot of them have illustrations, and that's another thing that we're moving towards is just a whole lot of illustrations to really depict what we're referring to. You know, it's a lot easier to convey to the customer or uh, the professional about what it is you're referring to when you're talking about maybe setbacks, floor area ratios, things, you know, articulations on, on buildings. A lot easier if you can do that in an image than just try to convey that with a bunch of word, you know, sentences or words. And so, um, you know, that, that'll be the format we're, we're proposing to move towards uh, and then get away from the dual column. But, yeah, we don't. I don't think there's any statutory requirement that we have it in the con certainly not in the column format. So, great. So we'll be hearing more of this as you move forward, and and I suppose the challenge will be to figure out how to structure the work of the commission and the subcommittee to that extent as well to not spend as much time as staff has spent, but nonetheless feel like we did look through and see, oh yeah, see how it is, and it did or did not come across, mm -hmm. and we do or do not care, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. there's several possibilities yeah. there. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to think about how to do that well. Yeah, and I think that was the point of uh, bringing it forward tonight was to, to give you an idea of, you know, what we're thinking as far as the structure of the table, uh, how we have it laid out um, with all the commercial and residential zones across the top, all the uses, you know, the idea of the NIACS table, 
Um, you know, the idea of the footnotes down at the bottom that represent the particular uh, instances, you know, particular uses for specific zones. And just to start thinking about that, and if you, you know, have great ideas about something that may be easier to work with or may portray it a little bit better, then we'd certainly love to, love to hear it. But, um, and then we'll, you know, put this in your packet, bring it forward, and take it home and look through all the uses and then really get into it and see uh, whether or not certain uses make sense in other zones or maybe some of the uses that are in there right now don't make sense in the zone that they are and should be taken out, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And so, Mike, you would also have um, a table you mentioned for side uh, for setbacks that would be separate that would yeah. Yeah, that would be complementary. And then yeah. can you think of any other tables that would also be needed? Parking um, requirement? Yeah. Yeah, good and, one. And yeah. Part, yeah, part of this would be uh, use table, uh, setbacks, building height, so the, the lot area, um, things of that nature on there, the bulk and dimensional standards, what we call them, and then uh, the parking table. We Do we actually do have floor area ratios in this community? We don't have, I don't think we don't so. Have floor yeah. Area okay, ratios. that's I was just yeah, Seattle an example. downtown yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um. But yeah, I mean the the parking table. I think we've had since uh, the at least the '80s. Mm -hmm. So it's it's probably about time to take a look at that. Uh, you know, a lot of the it's pretty limited as far as uses. Um, you know, it's only about a page and it's not very long and so you oftentimes you deal with uh, a lot of the some or some use that may not uh, fit uh, a use that's listed in the in the table so then uh, we have a, a planning guide that gives a bunch of standards from a bunch of different municipalities we usually take an average uh, in order to determine what the parking requirement is for that you know, odd use that you may not see in the table. So I think it's probably time to maybe revisit that, but I think that this needs to come before so we can identify all the uses that are going to be uh, included, and then we can try to formulate the parking table to reflect maybe everything that's in here without being uh, that long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now we're up to number eight, the shared readings discussion. Um, for the benefit of the public, um, we have a page linked from the Planning and Zoning City webpage, uh, which is called uh, Planning and Zoning Shared Readings. And we periodically are adding um, topically organized items to that. And this particular set is was inspired by the um, Historic Preservation Conference that was held here in Moscow in the late in September. And we have three titles, so Making Downtowns What They Used to Be, From Skid Row to Lodo, Historic Preservation's Role in Denver's Revitalization, and Downtown Revitalization, Sustainability, and Historic Preservation. Um, so I'd open up to comments or thoughts that you saw at the conference, that you saw in these papers? Um, well, I would offer first in the, in the, um, for in the first article, the, the making downtowns what they used to be, that it seems like there was a lot of, it was more urban design information that would be really helpful for gui uh, guidelines for legacy crossing or, or um, standards and goals. I mean, you know, in terms of things like the, um, the five D's, the density, diversity, design, distance to transit, and dis destination something, I can't read Accessibility. My Accessibility, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I, I probably in terms of how vibrant centers are, are created with multimodal transportation and opportunities for social interaction, you know, and some, of the, some goes with downtown as well, um, just uh, sort of indicators for a quality public realm. And mm -hmm. So I thought they were, and that was an Emily Talon's uh, um, part. I agree with those metrics, but 
uh, in that same paragraph, they had a link to uh, the EPA has rolled out its smart location database, which focuses on those five Ds. So I followed that link. I thought, well, this will be interesting. Let's see. Mm. Oh, yeah, and, I that, yeah. And th for Moscow, there is no data. For Lewiston, there is no data. <laughs> And for Spokane, there is data. There, it's it's big enough that mm -hmm. and, the EPA is studying it. <laughs> pretty much you, what you would expect. It yeah. gets denser as it right. goes towards the sort of division in the river kind of core of town. Um, so and, and so my what struck me was we talk about these things, but we, do we need to think on a different scale also because? There's that picture of New York in that article, you know. New, New York's downtown is bigger than Moscow. <laughs> and so the thinking is, is somewhat different, perhaps. Not to say it's not valuable to think about, but is there a small town nuance that they don't have here? Well, things like walk score, you can put your address in there and you can get mm -hmm. an automatic walk score for where you live right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that would be, you know, one example of data that's available to smaller communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it's, um, I think there are, there are more phil philosophical guidelines. Um, mm -hmm. than Other thoughts? I, I kind of had um, similar thoughts to what you were talking about with respect to scale. Um, mm -hmm. And it's difficult, I, I always struggle with how you scale something like a New York or a Denver to to Moscow, and one of the things, I can't remember which article it was, talked about um, this 1.6 kilometer uh, mm -hmm. circle, uh, which would translate to what, about a mile, and I'm thinking, gosh, that encompasses most of our town. <laughs> so, you know, they're talking about how we translate for a larger place this, this area, which now mm -hmm. encompasses our entire town. So how do we scale what we need to do so that it's, Meaningful and usable for, and I don't have an answer. I just I struggle with mm -hmm. how to do it, that. It, it's more like for us something like the what is it quarter six, mile six blocks six, <laughs> that 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 transit believes if if you're not within a certain distance you won't walk to the stop. Right. That's more our experience mm -hmm. I think than yep. than the mile rate. The mile radius is third and main. The edge of it is out on Mountain View, right? Yeah, and yeah. so the whole place. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I took the map out and drew a yeah. circle. And went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and that other one, the Lodo, we have our own Lodo district. Well, it's not historic to preserve, right? It's a, it's the um, legacy crossing uh, area that's vacated now, but that's the opportunity area. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike Denver, as you say, we don't have people chomping at the bit to tear down buildings and build new buildings, and you know we see a building turnover every few years, not, yeah. not, uh, not constantly, and no. not whole neighborhoods worth. Yeah, I just saw some of the same similarities, like when they were talking about vibrancy centers. You know, a lot of the same things where you, they have vibrant centers, and then they've got suburban commercial development. Well, if you look at our downtown core, we've got a lot of these things under vibrancy centers, mm -hmm. and regardless of how big or small the place is, I mean, we've got a lot of things uh, that are going on. And then later on in the article, it says, uh, you know, it's talking about members of Generation Y and millennials, empty nesters, uh, really emphasizing, you know, wanting to move to these vibrant centers. And then it goes on to say, uh, you know, the center's largest employers are often anchor institutions such as medical centers, universities, and major government offices or facilities. Young growing companies likely will attract, uh, will be attracted to such centers, but almost all companies will become more interested in live, work, play environments when they need young talent to replace older employees as they retire. So, you know, you think about Gritman doing the expansion, you know, the, their major presence in downtown, universities major presence, you know, we've got governmental presence, not really a large um, mayor, what you, you call major government offices, but I guess major for our town. 
mm -hmm. uh, are located downtown with City Hall being a historic building. So I think we've got a lot of these things. He, you know, yeah, MZ moving uh, downtown, you know, instead of wanting to be out in a technology park, they want to move downtown. So uh, doing the reinvestment there so they can do those things, live, work, and play uh, all in that same area. So I think that, you know, we may not be uh, as big as New York City or some of the other examples, but we've got a lot of the same uh, good things going for us. You know, historic buildings being uh, renovated downtown. You know, we've seen an uptick in that, and uh, it just seems like uh, you know the national trend uh, of adaptive reuse and, and just improvement in downtowns is you can kind of see that in, in downtown. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of had the same impression that in reading through it, I kept thinking, you know, these things are happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now having a child attending the high school, I become aware what she does at lunch, mm -hmm. which is she wanders off downtown somewhere. and. <laughs> lunch has gotten more expensive than when it was <laughs> school lunch. I can tell you that. Uh, so, so there's another piece that for mm -hmm. us is something that we would want to consider and understand is what is the role of that anchor business or business generator because of mm -hmm. the things that the high school does. I think it's significant. Yeah. The last article, the thing that struck me was his attempt to really expand the definition of sustainability. Yes. Um, he was looking at the embodied energy in existing buildings. Um, he was looking at uh, socioeconomic pieces. Um, talking about one example was um, it, it was tearing down a building, building a new building versus investing in rehabbing that building and how much more of the money stayed local because your ratio of materials that you imported to labor changed. If, 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 he made it cost the same amount but to a different ratio and that labor was, he presumed, local. In our case, on big projects, that labor is not local. It's being brought in. But on smaller projects, which what we might think rehabs were, might be a lot of fairly local labor and much more local money then, which is a very different idea of sustainability than just it's a lead platinum structure. You can have a lead platinum um, structure that generates its own energy, but people have to drive 30 miles into I mean, that's, it. that is the, the you know oxymoron about green buildings sometimes is uh, – that if they're not connected within an urban fabric where there's alternative transportation or walkability, how green are they? You know, and, and that's frustrated me as a preservationist about LEED for, for years is they, don't, they give really minimal credit uh, to um, historic buildings and yet it's the ultimate recycling program. I mean, you know, you're not generating waste. You have embodied energy and materials that have already been used to construct the building. You're not disassembling that and putting it in a landfill that has to be taken to Oregon or wherever. And, you know, it's, it, it's, there are just many dimensions of um, historic preservation that, I mean, I, I liked his comment that historic preservation is sustainable development, but green buildings are not necessarily sustainable mm -hmm. development. And I, I hadn't really heard it stated that way, but I, I tend to agree with it. <laughs> yeah. um, that, and also revitalizing a downtown starts to con preserve land and, you know, and concentrate development, all the things that we talked about in the other article that the densities um, ratios are higher in, in historic cores usually. So in this area, maybe not in Manhattan, but mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Um, I'll just update you. We haven't quite got to the point of having a new set of readings, but I have been having a conversation with um, a fellow at an organization called Urban Three, who has been doing some interesting mapping visualization kind of work um, and looking at a, the sort of economic sustainability side here of 
um, the amount of tax revenue being generated by various land use choices. And um, he has an interesting piece. He says the city, you could think of the city as a land development organization. At any given point, it has a certain amount of land resource. Some's built, some's unbuilt. And the role of its planning department and us is to manage that portfolio. The land amount is finite. And in many places, of course, you can't just keep expanding because there is no green field next to you. It's somebody else's city next to you. Um, and it was like, huh, I'd never thought of us as managing the, the development portfolio of the city. But you would be thinking about the revenue that you get from that and the expenses that you have to meet, sort of the abstract view of the budget. Um, at any rate, I have one article, and I think we'll look to find something else that's complementary to read. The proposal that is floating is to see if we can bring this guy here to do a presentation and maybe some sort of a charrette where we, having seen his as abstract idea, though Bill Belknap has started to do some of that kind of analysis with our data. I'd like to see it done with our data. But then say, hey, if we're thinking that way, what would we think? And where would we think, you know, try to tune ourselves up to parts of town that might be more interesting to think about or focus on or something. So, and the reason to mention that is, I, I want you to read the articles that, the proposal would be to use some of our budget for this year to fund that and then also go to the uh, URA and ask them to kick in. And then um, uh, we were talking about also, this is Bill, Mike, and I, um, seeing if we could go to the university and see if they, they'll kick in a little bit, um, either the art and architecture folks or the masters in public administration folks. Um, anyway, so just kind of a heads up as to an idea that's floating out there. We're, we're struggling with it to find dates that aren't the beginning of the semester or the middle of spring break. Or <laughs> okay, anything else for the good of the order? Um, I yeah. just wanted to make a brief comment uh, about the uh, Historic Preservation Conference. I thought yeah. it was wonderful. Oh, um, Wendy and Nels did a tremendous job, uh, and I just, uh, there were so many interesting and valuable things that came out of that conference, and it was, it was exciting to see it here and do the, the tours of places that you think you know and find out that you don't know as much as you thought you did. It was great. I, I just thought it was a wonderful conference, and I appreciated all the work that went into it. Oh, thank you. And Mike was a, a big uh, um, organizer, had major organizational responsibilities as we were, at least the local committee was planning and connecting. Well, you know, thanks, so, Mike. It, it was yeah. great. It really um, was. Yeah, we got over 200 people registered for, you know, which for Moscow is a pretty big, big Boise, achievement. Uh, yeah. Attendance. Exceeded the Boise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good deal. So that good was deal. Good too. <laughs> All right, and thank you for throwing that in. Uh, anything else? We're adjourned.